Thank you, Jack. And uh, thank you to Neil and uh, Helen and all the other organizers for uh, putting this together. Um, <clears throat> I think it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's very interesting to to, to see the progression of this. <laughs> uh, you know, we we sort of put together the idea for Polymer back in uh, in 2015. And uh, the, the the sort of landscape of GP of uh, nurse excuse here with GP a different path the effort and uh, and the overall push getting our, our user base ready for GPUs has been um, really spectacularly successful. And <clears throat> so let me give a really short and none of this will be surprising to you all, but just set the tone here. Um, let me see here. Okay, and you can all see um, the slides. <clears throat> okay, so um, obviously it's uh, very fitting to talk about Perlmutter on GPUs for science because uh, it does actually provide GPUs for science. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in the NERSC sort of pantheon of systems, um, Perlmutter is right there in the middle, <laughs> uh, at least of this slide. So, uh, you know, uh, starting in, in 2021, we started deploying uh, parts of Perlmutter and, uh, and actually we made uh, uh, the GPU accelerated nodes, uh, the very first uh, things that were uh, available to our staff and then to uh, some early users and then all users. Uh, and so uh, typically, as you can see, you know, from the progression here, we have a, a new system every few, uh, every few years. And uh, Nurse 9 in, is in some ways uh, new, and it's in some ways a continuation of what uh, we initiated with Cori, where, you know, there were many core um, CPUs and uh, the, the sort of uh, parallelism and, and things like that, that uh, and the advanced architectures that were kicked off in that era continued on uh, with uh, with Perlmutter. <clears throat> um, so at a very high level, like Jack said, it is a system that's been optimized for, for science, right? And so by that, we mean we don't just have one kind of thing on the system. We have, in fact, um, many different things, and we, we make sure that they try to work well together, right? So we have CPU-only nodes, um, we have uh, GPU accelerated nodes, which uh, I'm sure are very interesting to all of you. Um, we have an all flash, uh, high performance all flash file system. And then from the user, you know, the first things that the user sees on the, on the system or even getting used to the system are, uh, are you know, things like uh, either the login nodes or, or, or nodes that aren't, uh, necessarily optimized for 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 you know high performance compute but provide the basic uh, foundational blocks to allow you to do uh, to compose your workflows to do uh, you know long running uh, services make sure that long running services are there in support of all of the hpc and we sort of put all together lash all this together with this high performance interconnect uh, that we have, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But then in addition, to, to sort of bring together the NERSC uh, environment, we we sort of make sure that, you know, external file systems and networks can connect well uh, and have a good path into the system, right? <clears throat> um, and so a little bit more detail on this, which uh, I think hopefully should be familiar to people who've actually, you know, been on the system now. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, we can sort of broadly divide the system into to sort of three bits, right? One is all of these gray boxes, which are the, the supporting environment, right? So the login access nodes, service nodes, how we manage the system is using a, a Kubernetes uh, system management orchestration. Uh, uh, and it's not, uh, you know, so that, that isn't directly visible to the users, but it does uh, have some features that will make the user environment on and the access to the system much more uh, useful and interesting. Uh, and then we have the compute portion, which is right now, like I said, composed of GPU uh, accelerated nodes uh, and uh, CPU nodes. Uh, and then all of this is sort of tied together with these um, slingshot switches. So slingshot is the uh, high bandwidth, uh, uh, low latency network that uh, HPE has uh, put together for the system. Uh, and uh, that is, in fact, you know, what allows uh, Perlmutter to be, and I'll show you the differences from Cori, but 
all of this is under one network um, for uh, for this system, right? In addition, you know, uh, there's not a lot of point in having a system that nobody can sort of get to uh, and do interesting things on. So we have a very resilient and high bandwidth uh, link to the NERSC net, uh, network and uh, the world, right? So this uh, this these this picture here on the lower left shows you that you know we have um, we have Perlmutter, all of this uh, slingshot network, and then we have a very high bandwidth uh, connection to the edge of Perlmutter, uh, and that's resilient. Uh, and so this is multi terabits per second. And then from the edge router, we have another multi-terabit per second connection, uh, but a smaller multi-terabit per second connection to the nurse network um, and then to the world, right? Uh, so this nurse network is all encompassing, right? So it's it's stuff like your uh, DTN nodes, it's stuff like HPSS, uh, it's Cori, uh, all of the other uh, stuff that's outside of Perlmutter. So. <clears throat> Um, let's see. So in terms of the specific hardware, uh, you know, obviously for, for the GPUs uh, portion, uh, the most interesting one is the GPU accelerated nodes. And these have four uh, NVIDIA A100 uh, uh, GPUs per node, right? And so you can actually um, see them over here uh, on this uh, little picture here, which is an actual motherboard. Um, these are... Uh, you know, they're 40 gigabytes uh, per second, uh, sorry, 40 gigabytes of uh, high bandwidth memory per GPU, uh, which gives you a total of 160 uh, gigabytes of the high bandwidth memory. Uh, and then uh, all of those GPUs are linked uh, together with this NVLink 3. In addition to actually drive the node, uh, uh, since the GPUs are not yet able to do that, um, we have an a a AMD, um, uh, Milan uh, chip to do that. We also have uh, on the GPU nodes a, a DRAM, right? So we have 256 uh, gigabytes of DRAM. And you can actually see that here, uh, these uh, between these copper uh, fins. And then uh, because we have four GPUs, we have four slingshot NICs per node. Uh, and then on the CPU only nodes, uh, we have just the two CPUs. Um, and uh, with uh, because we then have a lot more real estate on the motherboard. We are able to give you 512 gigabytes of DRAM per uh, CPU node uh, and only one slingshot NIC per uh, node. So then the GPUs themselves are hooked up together like this. And then they're connected to the um, to the rest of the node here by this picture on the top uh, left. Uh, and you can see that uh, the, they have PCI connections to the chip, uh, to the NIC, and then to the outside world. And then uh, amongst themselves, they can talk uh, and be like. <clears throat> uh, so from a system point of view, let me just take a minute here and uh, talk about the, the features. Shasta is the system or uh, management framework stack that we have on the nodes. And so this is a sort of a typical picture here you can see, but there are some differences to standard sort of large clusters or large supercomputers. We have a, a whole bunch of non-compute nodes on the left, and then we have all the compute nodes uh, on the right. Uh, the non-compute nodes in this case are in fact managed with this um, cloud managed infrastructure, right? So this is very similar to what the large, very large cloud providers use. And there are some certain benefits to, to doing it at this scale, at the scale we have as well. Uh, it gives you sort of the service oriented architecture that allows us to use um, uh, a lot of the, the new developments and sort of system management capabilities and so on that are that are out there to manage the system. The compute nodes themselves are bound, uh, booted off of bare metal. So there aren't any uh, directly user accessible, uh, uh, you know, cloud uh, managed, uh, cloud uh, oriented features on there. Uh, but there is a bunch of uh, sort of value that we can leverage from this cloud thing, right? So we can, we have a, we have a system wide um, API uh, that users can get access to to help control some aspects of, of their workflows. And, uh, and then it, all of the services themselves are, are resilient when we, when we put them on this, on this framework here. Right. So both, uh, so at a very high level, the, 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 the sort of user environment nodes, which are the sort of worker nodes and the login nodes are all controlled using this uh, uh, Kubernetes. And the compute nodes themselves are not directly controlled Kubernetes, but the, the entire boot orchestration process is controlled using Kubernetes. <clears throat> um, 
So in terms of differences from Cori, I mentioned, I think people are familiar with Cori. Uh, again, the, the main thing is all of Perlmutter, which is this middle thing here on the ref, on, uh, on this slide is uh, control is under one slingshot network, right? So, whereas as compared to Cori, where you had, um, uh, you know, you have the two partitions, the Haswell and the KNL partitions, uh, those along with the associated service nodes and the, you know, the booting nodes and as well as the nodes that help you get uh, access to the file system are all part of the ARIES network, but um, the access nodes as well as the the storage itself is on a different network. So there's a uh, network translation happening at some level um, for uh, for Cori uh, between say the, the KNLs and the IO nodes or KNLs and the path to the outside world. Uh, whereas in Slingshot, everything is on one network. And uh, you can see this picture here on the far right that shows you those elect those uh, network connections that are there between what we call each uh, each group. So largely speaking, each one of these uh, little dots is is a cabinet on the compute side, and uh, uh, to first approximation, and then uh, on uh, the rest of the cabinets are all the service cabinets and so on. And you can see the network connections that go between them, as well as the connections to the outside world. So um, the sort of deceptively small uh, connection here is in fact our our high bandwidth connection to uh, uh, to the rest of uh, NERSC. <clears throat> Uh, so in terms of the software, I think uh, you know you'll you'll hear more about this through uh, sort of proxies as proxies of the talks that you're getting. But you know we have a very rich and robust programming environment as well as uh, uh, support for various programming models and languages. And I won't go into great detail, but uh, it's just to note that you know there's a very good coverage of of things that are both uh, formally supported by the vendor, but also sort of nurse supported in the sense that. And their staff, and this is the the team that uh, you know Jack and uh, and uh, other groups, uh, Rebecca's group, and others all are part of, uh, are uh, you know strongly supporting all of these uh, programming environments that we have on the system that'll help make the the system very productive. Uh, as a science teaser, Jack uh, talked about this, but you know I just want to note that you know NERSC has a very broad user base, right? And you can sort of look at here the, the the pie charts on the left here show you that breadth of user base, which is basically we're using um, uh, uh, where they get their support from from the DOE Office of Science, um, uh, under which one of these offices. And so you can see here we have very good coverage, broad coverage, both amongst the GPU node and the CPU node usage on Perlmutter uh, across for the last year. Uh, and uh, that sort of also translates to the kinds of science that's happening. And Dak talked about a little bit, ranging from so we've sort of had these three pillars that we've uh, tried to support on Perlmutter, uh, you know, uh, traditional simulation data and uh, machine learning. And so uh, we've had successes in all three of these uh, pillars at the beginning of this uh, rollout of Perlmutter. And you can see some of the examples here on on, on this slide. <clears throat> And then finally, uh, in terms of the future, I'm almost uh, I'm out of time. So uh, uh, you know, Perlmutter is is being just being introduced, right? So it'll have a, uh, a long and storied life ahead of it. Uh, but we're not sort of just statically going to keep the system here. There are uh, a whole bunch of improvements that uh, our systems folks, as well as the the user integration folks, are doing to this system to help make it better every single uh, you know year. And so we can sort of bucket those into three large buckets. One is sort of operational improvements that help us keep the system up and running and without the least amount of impact and uh, uh, hopefully to give you the most amount of productivity. Um, uh, in terms of the user environment, uh, we're gonna be able to start uh, giving access to uh, container-based environments that allow users a lot more control over what they see when they log into the system and the kinds of things that they can immediately do, which is again, a, a win for productivity. And then on the access side, we're gonna have a whole bunch of API driven interactions that we're gonna be enable, um, we're gonna be able to uh, enable uh, very soon, including uh, things like uh, new ways of interacting with the workload manager through say RESTful interfaces, uh, management of uh, automated tools like GitLab runners for CI CD stuff, as well as data improvement operations. So let me stop there. And we're really uh, 
thankful to the community here of users who, uh, who have enabled the system to be uh, uh, you know, very productive. And we look forward to, uh, to giving you all permutter for, uh, to enable great science. Thank you uh, very much. <clears throat> Let me just stop sharing.